So we can please uh, chant the Mangala Charanam prayers. If you know these prayers, you can please join in. Uh, if you don't, you can follow along. It's in the Bhagavad Gita. If you have a copy, then you can read the Bhagavad Gita. It's on page number one. Literally, it starts from number one in the book. And uh, if you don't know, then you can just meditate on the transcendental sound vibration. Om Gyana Timirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshuram Militangena Tasmai Shri Guru Venamaha Shri Chaitanya Manu Bishtam Stapitam Gena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dati Swapadantikam Vandeham Shri Gurun Shri Uta Parakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunathan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sarvetam Sabadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakan Vitamscha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopisha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchana Gaurange Radhe Vrindavanishwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Vyevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vazadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Jai Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai Bhagavad Gita as it is Ki Jai Ananta Kodi Vaishnava Rinda Ki Jai Nita Gauda Premanandi Hari Hari Bo So thank you very much everyone for um, joining being present this evening. I'm sure there are many other things you could be doing on a Thursday evening rather than tuning in to Zoom uh, and learning about the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, I think this is the best use of our time, invaluable in fact. Uh, there's not enough gold in this world to pay for the, the priceless opportunity to hear Bhagavad Kata. So here we are together um, to discuss the Bhagavad Gita. This evening we're specifically going to uh, be going through the, the chapter 14, Three Modes of Material Nature. And this chapter is uh, very wonderful, uh, very special. And in fact, uh, the I've explained before, and probably all of you already know, that the Bhagavad Gita is compared to like a sandwich that you have the first six chapters, the last six chapters, which are like the the bread or the, the cushion that holds the important filling, the ingredient, which is the middle six chapters. So the first six chapters are karma yoga, the middle six chapters are bhakti yoga, and the last six chapters are jnana yoga. And jnana yoga means that it's focusing primarily on knowledge of the material world, and how the material world functions, knowledge of Prakriti. Uh, based on 
principles and ideas of Sankhya philosophy. So the let me get this there we go back one here. So what is the connection between the previous chapter? Uh, nature, the Enjoyer, and Consciousness. Uh, it was chapter 13. So, <clears throat> um, chapter 13 kind of explained how the living entity, the Purusha, is entangled in the external energy of Prakriti due to our, his or her, our desire for enjoyment. And chapter 14 now is going to explain how that material energy, how Prakriti binds us, the spirit soul, through the mechanism of the three modes of material nature. So like that, this is going to be expanded on. So uh, as you know, using uh, Sutta Papru's acronyms book, this chapter has an acronym. Uh, it has four sections and the acronym is TRAP, T-R-A-P. Uh, three modes, race for prominence, actions in the modes, and pure life. So the first section is verses 1 through 9. And the idea is that we need to understand the conditioning of the three modes. And this can be a very powerful tool to assist us on the path of self-realization. And Srila Prabhupada explains this later that we'll discuss. And we're also going to try to do, I said, if time permits, a section um, uh, that I do from another course that I teach called Guna Management. So we'll try to get to that. So first, in, in text one, Srila Prabhupada, in his purport, he makes a, a very powerful statement um, that uh, we can use philosophical speculation to try to understand this uh, these teachings in this chapter generally we don't encourage speculation that's something that's frowned upon but philosophical speculation means that based on things I've read based on things I've heard from bona fide sources based on this based on that then we can extrapolate or understand how this seems to be working so um, it's mentioned here because there's a difference between mental speculation and philosophical speculation. So we take that everything is known by the uh, psychological action of the mind. So this philosophical speculation is the same uh, isn't is the same as mental speculation only if it is merely the random or haphazard activity of the brain trying to understand everything and make theories out of it. But philosophical speculation is directed by Shastra and by Guru. And if the goal of such philosophical speculation um, is to achieve Krishna or Vishnu, then that philosophical speculation is not mental speculation. Um, it's just like this. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita that I am the taste in water. So philosophical speculation is... Uh, is accepting the sense means try to understand under the direction of Shastra Guru how Krishna is the taste in water so like that so anyway this we could get quite in depth to this but I'm not going to but it's interesting that Prabhupada says we should use philosophical speculation but that is not the same as mental speculation like that so we can understand that <clears throat> uh, from text 3 Krishna explains that Prakriti is the, um, the supreme mother, the mother supplying the living entities. That's us, by the way. Us, we are the living entities supplying us um, with material bodies. And the total material substance of this world is called the Brahman. Uh, and it's the source of our birth. Um, so the Lord impregnates that Brahman and basically gives birth, the birth is given through Prakriti, um, through that Brahman energy to the living entities. Now, my experience, uh, and some of you are new, my experience is that there's often many words that sound the same. You have Brahman, Brahmana, Brahma, <laughs> Parabrahma, 
parabrahman, you know, you have all these different words and it becomes like, what is being talked about here? At least for me, very confusing in the beginning. So especially there are four words that are talked about kind of throughout this chapter. Uh, the term Brahman, Parabrahman, Brahma, and Brahmana. <laughs> so you, we might think, uh, what is all of that? Well, they sound the same because they're they're all sl ever so slightly connected. But Brahman is the total substance um, of the absolute truth, spirit, uh, the effulgence we call the Brahma Jyoti. So this is Brahman. Parabrahman is specifically the Supreme Lord Himself. He is the Parabrahman. Para means like supreme or great, like Param Atma. That means it's an Atma, but it's the great Atma that's coming from Krishna. Brahma is um, Brahma is Lord Brahma, the original creator or living entity and engineer of the universe. And Brahmana, uh, Brahmana is a person who is, um, as we'll discuss in the 18th chapter, has the qualities of peacefulness, self-control, austerity, purity, tolerance, honesty, and knowledge. And usually a Brahmana is uh, the, the classification of persons who are fixed in spiritual knowledge, who are absorbed in Brahman, <laughs> absorbed in spiritual knowledge. So like that. Now there's an analogy that's given in the purport to text 3, which describes a scorpion being born from rice. And Srila Prabhupada gives this analogy um, to explain how it can look like a scorpion is being born out of rice, but actually the mother scorpion has laid eggs in the rice and then later those eggs hatch and the scorpions come out. But because one doesn't see the mother and one may think that the rice has given birth to the scorpions. But actually the rice is not the cause. So in the same way, the, um, the material energy is not truly the origin of our, our birth. We may think we're these bodies. We may think we come from the material energy. But no, the material energy is simply facilitating the original or the actual seed-giving father, as is mentioned in the fourth verse, is Krishna. So actually, the origin is Krishna, just like the origin of the scorpion's eggs is the mother, not the rice, and the rice is compared to the material energy. Hopefully this is all making a little bit of sense and is not too confusing. So it goes on in, chat, in text 5 to explain that the living entity, how the living entity gets conditioned. So we can see this is a picture of a, a mouse or a rat in a cage and how they train the uh, rat to feed himself. And they use a, a mechanism of a speaker and some signaling lights and then there's a little lever that he pushes and over here there's a little hatch where the food pellets come through but you can see he's sitting on an electric grid which is plugged into the shock generator <laughs> so uh, it's not actually so funny but it's funny because this is life for us too um, so the little mouse he wants to get something to eat so if he pushes the right button then he gets a pellet if he pushes the wrong button he gets a shock and then he eventually becomes conditioned to only push the right button. He eventually learns, but he may have to go through several shocking episodes <laughs> before he learns his lesson to push the correct buttons. So like that. So the, we are these conditioned living entities and we're living in a world where there is happiness and distress. And we try to avoid distress and we try to move towards happiness. Uh, meanwhile, getting to happiness means sometimes we have to endure a few shocks along the way. But it's generally understood that we move more quickly away from pain than we do towards pleasure. So the living entities in the material world are unfortunately suffering in so many ways. 
Um, although the living entity, the jiva, the atma, is actually transcendental, but he's become conditioned, excuse me, by the material world, and thus, under the uh, spell of material modes, he gets different bodies and different activities, which cause him to suffer because uh, we, he, are in um, a state of like amnesia. We've forgotten our original spiritual nature and we're trying to enjoy this material energy as a material being, but we're not actually material. So the whole foundation of the, of the formula is, is, uh, is, is dysfunctional. Um, so we're trying to experience everlasting pleasure in a temporary world. So the formula will never work. We're never going to find everlasting pleasure in the temporary. It's just not possible. So therefore, that's always going to create some anxiety, some stress, some suffering, some difficulty like that. So <clears throat> these three modes, uh, material nature, they bind us. And the next group of verses, 6 through 8, describes the different effects that the modes have on, or e the effects that each of the modes have on us. And um, one after another, they explain the ways in which goodness, passion, and ignorance. And we're going to go into to much more depth. But these three modes of material nature, the three modes are goodness, passion and ignorance, for those of you who don't know. The Sanskrit terms um, uh, are goodness is sattva, sattva gun, passion is raja gun, and ignorance is tamagun. And guna is the Sanskrit term for, it's used for mode. So the three gunas, uh, trigunya. So like that. So you can see this is how the, the three modes are working. Their binding forces for goodness, we become conditioned by happiness. And passion, we become conditioned by an attachment to getting the fruits of our activities, getting the results of our activities. And ignorance condition us, us by laziness and madness and sleep. Um, different characteristics you can see are explained here that the body is illuminated by knowledge and goodness. There's intense desires and passion, and there's delusion and ignorance. The destination uh, for someone in the mode of goodness is they attain to the higher planets uh, or to the planets of the great sages. Uh, the destination for those in passion is that they attain the earthly planets again. And the destination of those in the mode of ignorance is that they get birth in lower species. And then the results of the actions that is purity and goodness, it's misery and passion, and it is foolishness and illusion in ignorance. So there's a saying that the mode of passion is nectar in the beginning, but it is poison in the end. So mode of passion, we can understand that it feels good at first, but there's always a price to pay later. Goodness is, um, is uh, challenging in the beginning. The poison is at the beginning, but the nectar is in the end because you have to go through the austerity of being self-controlled to perform a mode of goodness activity. But in the end, you benefit. And the mode of ignorance is poison in the beginning and poison at the end. It's just a suffering condition from beginning to end. So like that, some information about the three modes. So the next section is the race for prominence. And after describing the effects of the modes, Krishna is now going to explain to Arjuna that the modes are not constant in their influence upon the living ent entity. According to our karma and our work, our association, our choice of food, and so on, a particular mode becomes more prominent at different times, so like that. So um, one who is actually intent on advancing in Krishna consciousness, Srila Prabhupada says in verse 10, 
has to transcend these three modes like that. So, um, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so like that. Okay. Sorry, this thing keeps popping up. It's a little distracting. Okay, so in text 11, it mentions that uh, all the gates of the body have to become illuminated by knowledge. This is symptom of the of the modes, uh, a symptom of the mode of goodness. So perception by senses, uh, based on knowledge, in the right position means we're clean inside and clean out. And what are the gates? The gates, all the gates are illuminated. Well, the body is described as having nine gates, nine gates, and those gates are two eyes, two nostrils, one mouth, two ears, and the genital and the rectum. So those are the nine gates into the body, and all of those must be illuminated with knowledge. And what does that mean? It means that they're... Um, we use them and they are they are used by the soul, not that they use the soul or direct the soul. That they're engaged in activity that is in the mode of goodness or transcendence and then they become illumined by knowledge. So they must be used correctly. If used incorrectly, then they're either in rajas or tamas, like that. But we'll discuss a little bit more later. So there are many actions uh, within the modes. This is the next section, verses 14 through 18. And uh, it's discussed about uh, the passing away or uh, leaving this world and how that can also be done in different modes. So... Um, Death in the mode of goodness is called Amalan, and it indicates free from the mode of passion and ignorance. And the mode of goodness is the purest form of existence in the material world. And those who leave this world or pass away, in the mode of goodness, it's described that they're elevated to uh, higher planets where the great sages and great devotees live, or to the heavenly spheres. Death in the mode of passion and ignorance which is discussed in text 15, establishes that after human life, the soul can also go down to lower existence. Um, so this also refutes that one can never go down from human life. Uh, some, some groups, even some Vedantists, believe that once you achieve the human platform, you can never go backwards into the animal, animal kingdom. But that's refuted here by the uh, the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita, which explains that actually you can go backwards. It's not always a forward journey. So like that. Um, so this is death. And then different actions in the modes. Um, ignorance leads to uh, misery. And some of the examples is that the performer is without knowledge and therefore all activities lead to misery. And the next life is an animal life. So animal life is always miserable, but under illusion, one does not understand this. And the grossest type of ignorance, Srila Prabhupada explains in his purport, is slaughtering poor animals for the taste of the tongue. And especially the killing of a cow is most vicious. Um, so Prabhupada discusses that in depth and the purport to text 18, that this is the grossest type of ignorance. So this is, as I was mentioning earlier, that the senses should be illumined with knowledge, which means they should be utilized in accordance with proper understanding, in alignment with Dharma. When they're used in that way, then they can be instruments for our perfection. If they're used um, in either rajas or in ignorance, then they become a source of our degradation. So like that, and Prabhupada specifically honing in on this point here about the senses being engaged and actions in the mode of ignorance. So we move to the final section, which is P for pure life. 
and this section 19 to 27, the final concluding verses, having described the all-pervasive control of the modes of nature, now Krishna is going to tell us in this final section how to transcend uh, these modes, and he then is going to also explain his position in relation to the modes of material nature. So Krishna is going to now explain to us how to move beyond these three modes, and at the same time, what is his relationship to the three modes. So in text 19, um, it's explained that one can transcend the modes by understanding the science properly. So the science of, not the science of the universe and its mechanisms in one sense, but understanding the science of Krishna consciousness. And we have to understand that properly by learning it from those souls who have heard it from authority, and that is the disciplic succession, eva, uh, disciplic succession, evam param praptam imam vijarshi vidu. So one can understand reality only from proper authority. And these days, the scientists, they are the proper authority, they are the authority, but yet somehow the scientific explanations seem to change year on year. You know, every year there's a new proposition, oh, maybe it's like this, maybe it's like that. So one has to take shelter of Krishna and um, become free from the influence of the modes of material nature and can then impart knowledge which brings liberation from the modes. So knowledge, knowledge of the functioning of the modes and knowledge how to conduct ourselves in accordance with them is the mechanism by which we can transcend them. Now I find this very interesting because I don't know about all of you, but when I went to school, they didn't teach me anything about the modes of material nature. <laughs> and in fact, everyone there was all just absorbed in the modes of material nature. And no one taught me anything about any of the gunas or acting in this way. In fact, everyone is more or less in most educational institutions, you're being taught how to uh, be driven by passion maybe how to use knowledge and goodness, but usually it's how to use knowledge and goodness to get a good job so that you can earn money, so that you can enjoy. That is the general driving principle. But no one's really explaining the three modes of material nature, so no one's giving us knowledge of really how the world is functioning. So Personally, when I was exposed to this, I found it quite revolutionary. And I remember even before reading this, this statement, I remember thinking, I really wish they would have taught me this in school when I was a young child so I could have understood, you know, oh, I'm acting in this way and maybe it's better if I don't act that way because there'll be certain repercussions. But here we all are. We're all still in school. So at least we're learning now. So like that. So transcend the modes. And then uh, Arjuna asked three questions. He asked, what are the symptoms of someone who has transcended the modes? What is their behavior? And he inquires, how do they transcend? So Krishna answers in text 22 through 25. And he explains that the symptoms of someone who is transcended is one when one neither desires attainment of pleasure nor desires to escape from pain. Now that is very profound because <clears throat> we can imagine that, okay, we might come to a point where I'm trying not to desire pleasure. But if pain comes along, I'm certainly not going to try to avoid it. So to come to the transcendental platform means that I'm not, I'm not averse to, to pain and I'm not attached to pleasure. And there's a word that Srila Prabhupada uses repeatedly throughout the Bhagavad Gita as it is. And that term is equipoised equipoise, that one becomes equipoised 
means equally positioned, posed, in the middle. One is not swaying this way or swaying that way. One is just equipoise. So no matter what's happening in the world around, one is absorbed in Krishna consciousness. This is actually really one of the only ways or the, the easiest and primary way to become transcendental or equipoise that we're just focused on the service of Krishna. And what is the behavior of that person? That they will always, un and the embodied soul will always undergo dualities of loss and gain, but the liberated soul can remain unaffected by these things due to focusing his identity within. So because the we as living entities, in order to be transcendental, we become absorbed within. Our, our world is the internal world of a connectivity with Krishna who is residing within us. He's also residing outside of us and he permeates everything in this material world. But we, we find a sacred space within ourselves that means that even amidst the greatest chaos externally, we find that space that means that there's like an eye of the hurricane. There's a, a peaceful sanctuary. And so therefore we can become unaffected by these external um, uh, chaos or distractions like that. And then finally the answer to the question, how does one transcend? And Krishna explains very clearly. He says you can transcend by pure devotional service. One can transcend and achieve Brahman liberation. Now, this is an interesting question or a statement because one may ask, well, we don't want Brahman liberation. We actually want to go back to be with Krishna and serve Krishna eternally. But Krishna explains in text 26 that <clears throat> the qualification to serve is to be in Krishna consciousness and it implies acquiring qualitative equality with Krishna, Satchitananda, that we first have to realize ourselves as spiritual beings, come to the point where we realize that I am, uh, as the, the statement from the Vedanta Sutra, Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman, I am spiritual, I am a spirit being, I am spirit soul. Now that doesn't mean I am Parabrahman, I am not God, but I am godly. I am of the nature of God. I am of the quality of God. I am Sat Chit Ananda. I am eternal, full of knowledge and full of bliss. I am the spirit soul. I am not this temporary body. So the analogy that Srila Prabhupada gives is the gold mine and the particle of gold. Um, so to be, uh, uh, yeah, a particle of gold is gold, but it's not the same as the gold mine. The gold mine is obviously qu quantitatively much more immense, but the particle of gold and the gold mine are in essence the same quality, but quanti quantitatively they are distinct and different like that. And then the conclusion, <clears throat> uh, Krishna explains that I am the basis of the impersonal Brahman. So there are many personalities who somehow study the Bhagavad Gita and they, as Prabhupada would say, screw out some meaning that, um, you know, there isn't the, the ultimate goal is impersonal uh, and that the impersonal Brahman is the highest. But Krishna so very clearly says here that I am the basis of the impersonal Brahman. So like that, um, Krishna therefore expands his answer for clarification and he ends this chapter 14 by describing his own relationship to Brahman. And thus again he stresses the principle of bhakti. Yes, all of this knowledge is very useful, it's very important, it's very good, but ultimately the way to transcend is by bhakti, by devotional service to me. So 
this concludes the overview of the chapter. I just wonder if there's anyone who has any questions, and uh, then we can move on to uh, this a little bit more in-depth look at the gunas and how to manage them. All right, we had um, one question on the chat um, about the Virat Rupa. Uh, you saw that. Um, so it's just asked, she's just, uh, it's Asha Singh Weber, Mataji, and she's just asking how, how to worship this form of the Almighty and is the chanting, and is chanting as Om the correct way to pay homage uh, regarding the um, uh, Virat Rupa? Okay, so please expand on the Virat Rupa and how to worship this form of the Almighty. Well, in general, the Virat Rupa is not considered a, uh, an eternal form, a transcendental form. It is um, more or less a, not exactly a concocted form, but it's an imaginary form of how we can see the material world um, in connection with the body of the Supreme. So the Virat Rupa you know, um, when it's described, and especially the Bhagavatam is very expert uh, in several sections describing the universal form. The Virat Rupa is a universal form, and of course the 11th chapter uh, describes the universal form. This is the Virat Rupa. And the ideas like the lakes and the rivers are his veins, and the sun and the moon are his eyes, the trees are the hairs on his body, the mountains are the bones. But this isn't an actual form. This is a way to bring someone who is attached to the material and so that they begin to connect that material energy, these material things, to the form of the Lord. But it is a bona fide process or method by which someone can make spiritual progress and spiritual advancement, which is why Shukadeva Goswami goes into great depth in describing it, primarily because some of the persons who've gathered in the assembly where he's speaking to, uh, to um, Parikshit Maharaj, many of them are impersonalists. So this this virat rupa form is not excuse me a form by which we can actually really focus our bhakti on it nor is it actually an eternal form of the lord so um and is chanting just chanting just om the correct way to pay homage you can chant om krishna explains in bhagavad gita he is uh he's uh, the chanting of the syllables om um, of course, in the age of Kali, the Yuga avatar is Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and he has come specifically to uh, Samstarpa, uh, Dharma Samstarpa Nataya. He has come to establish the principles of Dharma. And the Dharma, or the religious practice in the age of Kali, is to chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. This is the Harinam Sankirtan. It is a much more personal method of connecting with the Lord. Uh, but chanting Om is fine, but we should understand that it's sort of like <clears throat> if you have a relationship with someone and they call you and you have you want to have a more intimate and close relationship, you know, they may call you uh, by your first name. Um, <clears throat> if you have a very deep relationship with them, then you may call the, they may call you by a nickname or a pet name, or they may call you honey or sweetie or sweetheart or something like that. This is intimacy. But if someone is always calling you Mr. or Miss or Mr. or Miss, that's polite. It's nice, but it's not. It lacks intimacy. It's there as a respect. So Om is like addressing the Lord in that way you're addressing his energy. But by calling Hare and Krishna and Rama, you begin to enter into more of a um, personal relationship with the Lord. So I hope that makes sense. 
uh, uh, share. Um, I'm just going to vet the next question, if that's okay. So we'll go to Mansi, who's asked, um, what's the difference between impersonal and personal Brahman? And uh, yeah, and then she's asked another question as well about mental speculation. How do we uh, know if we are uh, philosophically speculating? Okay, so the difference between personal and impersonal Brahman. The Brahman is generally when the term is used, it it's and see this is the challenge sometimes with with the Sanskrit language. It's very refined, but just like even things in an English language can have subtly subtle different meanings. Like if someone says the word wicked. Like nowadays, you can say that was wicked, man, and that's like it's good. <laughs> but generally, the term wicked doesn't mean good; <laughs> it means really, really evil. So, you know, we can we can change things around, just like the term atma can mean uh, different different. It can mean the senses, it can mean the body, it can mean the soul, it can mean the mind, depending on the context in which it's used. In general, Brahman refers to the all-pervasive energy of God, of Krishna. So that's Brahman. And we're Brahman. Uh, everything is Brahman. Everything is the energy of God. As Krishna says in the 10th chapter, um, he says, Aham sarvasya prabhavo mata sarvam prabhartate iti matu bhajanti mam buddha bhava samam vidaha. I am the source of all spiritual and material worlds. Everything emanates from me. So that's Brahman. Now, in general, Brahman is considered impersonal. That's the way it's generally spoken. But, as I mentioned earlier, Pada Brahman is the reference to Krishna directly because he is the origin of Brahman. He is the Pada. He is the great Brahman. And that means that he is the source. As I just mentioned at the end, Krishna says, I am the source of this Brahman. I am the resting place of this Brahman. So that is kind of the distinction. And I hope that makes sense. And with regards to speculation, we did discuss that in the beginning. Mental speculation is when you kind of concoct things. Like I often mention how there are is a, a, a bona fide, not bona fide, but there is a, a, an accepted religion amongst the people in the world that God is a big bowl of spaghetti flying through space. This is obviously uh, some sort of mental concoction, <laughs> mental speculation. Of course, I can't say I've ever been flying through space, so I can't say I didn't see that flying bowl of spaghetti. But, you know, when we try to make things up from our own mental concoction, that is mental speculation. Philosophical speculation is when we take the teachings of Shastra and we take the teachings of Guru and the teachings of the sadhus, and we look at a principle and we try to understand it by amalgamating the knowledge together. And then we say, well, because this guru has said like this, this teacher has said like that, the Bhagavad Gita explains like this, Shukadeva Goswami has said like this, it seems that we can understand that it fits together like that. That's philosophical speculation. And that's fine, because it's not just mental speculation. So I hope that also makes sense and clarifies. Is that okay, Rajiv Pru? Anything else? Yeah, um, maybe we can do this question if we have time as the last one, yeah. or we could, uh, can you define devo devotional service for clarity? Yes, so uh, devotional service, this is a bhakti. So often um, people will say that the word bhakti just means devotion. Srila Prabhupada was very clear, especially in the nectar of devotion. Uh, the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu from Srila Rupa Goswami, Srila Prabhupada translated as nectar of devotion. He explains that bhakti is not just devotion, it's not just a sentiment, a feeling, but it is an action. It is an active principle. And that means that we have to do something. And that specific thing that we do if we have devotion is that we serve. 
So devotional service is bhakti, and it means we serve whom? We serve Krishna. Why? Because it is our eternal constitution. Jivara Swarupoi Krishnara Nichidas. We are eternally the servants of Krishna. So devotional service means that we conduct ourselves and act in accordance with who we are as spiritual beings, which means that we are eternally uh, Krishnara Nitya Das. Nitya Das means we are eternally the servant. And what does the servant do? The servant serves the master. And that is devotion. But how does the how should the servant serve the master? He should serve the master, he or she, with love, with devotion. So that's the idea. That's devotional service. That is bhakti. Is that okay? Does that answer? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I think that's that's what we've got for questions so far. Okay, shall we try to go through some guna management? We can do it in the mode of passion and do it in nine minutes, yeah? <laughs> yes, okay, so We'll just have a, a brief overview of this principle of guna management. So what does it mean? First, gunas in the uh, seventh chapter, text 14, daivyesha guna mayi mama maya duratyaya. Mameva ya prapadyante mayami tam tarantite, Krishna says. He says, Daivi Asha Guna Mai. Guna Mai. Uh, these Gunas, they're mine. Guna Mai. They're my Gunas. And they're Daivi. They're divine. These, these Gunas are divine. Daivi Asha Guna Mai. Mama Maya. Yes, they're, they're my Maya. It's created by me. Duratyaya, and they are very difficult to overcome. But, if, if one takes shelter of me, one can easily cross beyond these three modes of material nature, these three gunas. And there it's described that the gunas, they're like three ropes. Just like if you ever see, generally a, a thick rope, is like a braid. Ladies would know that you, when you braid your hair, that becomes strong. It's like a rope. So in the same way, these three modes, they become braided together and they become like this strong rope that, that binds us. And we could talk about that for some time, but we're not going to. So also it's described just like we see the three primary colors of yellow, red, and blue. On the color wheel, these three colors are the source of innumerable variety of colors. So in the same way, the three modes of material nature are the primary building blocks of the entire universe, of everything in the entire universe. The, the material variety comes because of these three modes of material nature, because of the, the three gunas. So therefore, from ignorance, passion, and goodness, in ever so slight variety, Srila Prabhupada would say three times three. Then he would say three times three times three. And so like that, you just keep going. So you would get like uh, in an initial understanding, you could have goodness, passion, and ignorance. Then you would have uh, goodness, 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 or passion, goodness, and ignorance, goodness. Then you would have uh, passion, goodness, or, or sorry, goodness, passion, 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 and ignorance, passion. And you would start to get all these varieties, just like the colors. And if we look around us, we see eh, there is such a variety of color and there's such a variety of species of life, such a variety of flowers, such a variety of trees, varieties of insects, varieties of fish, varieties of birds. Where did this all come from? Because of the three modes of material nature. They facilitate variety. So we usually do a little bit of a reflection part here. We're going to skip over this and just look more deeply into the three modes of material nature and how the, us as living entities are 
kind of trapped because those three modes, those ropes, they bind us. They tie us up in the material world and they conduct us like puppets and they pull us around and they make us act a certain way. We were on a, a, a call the other night and someone was saying something about <clears throat> punk rockers and they think they're all free and they can do whatever they want. Or people who are just like, yeah, I like to do what I want. I don't want to be pinned down by all of these other things. Meanwhile, they're just completely being orchestrated by the modes of material natures themselves. So the gunas are very powerful. It's a tool by which we can understand and master our own mind and body, our emotions, and we can transform every aspect of our lives if we understand the gunas, if we understand the modes of material nature, if we, if we have knowledge, first of all, about them, then when we look into the world, we see them working in everything that is happening. We can see it when we look in the room. If you look in the room that you're in right now, I don't know where you're sitting, but you look around. What mode is that room in? Is it in goodness? What does that mean? It means, is it clean? Is it tidy? Is it neat? Is it organized? Is it in passion? Papers piled up, things stacked here and there, things a bit dis Or is it in ignorance? Unclean, dust everywhere, dirt on the floor, uh, dishes in the sink. This is the modes in action. You know, open your fridge. <laughs> what mode is the fridge in? Uh, look in the closet, in the cupboard. Look in the shed outside. You know, clothes that you wear, the music that we listen to, the food that we eat, everything is in the modes. But few people in the West have ever even heard this term, yet the concept of the gunas is so powerful a tool for understanding and mastering our mind, body, and emotions. So we should understand them. And what are they? As I mentioned, sattva, rajas, and tamas. And so they work together, and tamas is ignorance, and its characteristics are madness, laziness, sleep, foolishness, like that. And a person is basically pursuing pleasure, but without any real commitment to it. So, you know, ignorance, they say ignorance is bliss. You know, so you just want to get some bliss out of the world, but really don't want to make any commitment. You know, I don't want to really put too much effort or endeavor into it. You know, I just kind of want to enjoy, you know what I'm saying? Right. So that's kind of a bit ignorance. And Raja's passion, uh, characterized by a greedy, passionate, agitated mind and senses, unlimited desires and being driven to fulfill desires and, you know, self-gain, egotistical. Generally, a person is pursuing pleasure and is committed to pleasure. There is a commitment now. The commitment is that I want to experience pleasure and I'm willing to work for it. And this commitment is shown through this striving for benefits, material benefits for himself and for those around him. So I'm willing to work hard to feel the fruits to, to get the benefit. That's rajas. And goodness or sattva means that um, there's purity and happiness and inner satisfaction, tolerance, humility, cleanliness, compassion, and searching for spiritual knowledge. So when one becomes frustrated with the rewards of his hard work, then one starts looking for something more refined and more refined ways to actually become happy in this world. One realizes that all the hard work may give me something, but that's still temporary. And then I'm left frothing at the mouth and chasing after uh, all of these, these fruits. There must be something higher. And then one finds that there should be a deeper level of satisfaction. So like this, we have to understand how these modes are working and how we are being pulled around by these modes. So these are some of the um, descriptions here of, of the different modes. Rajas, Thomas, you know, we can see where, where do we relate? 
how do these words describe? Are they describing us? Are they describing someone we know? Uh, is there, do we want to be in a different mode? You know, like that. So we start to look at these things. So first question is Thomas or ignorance. For many of us, we can start to see and manage the modes from first thing in the morning. Actually, mode management starts the night before the morning <laughs> because right now it is coming up to 9 p.m. And for most people, 9 p.m. is like the night is still young. In fact, I'm in London and I can hear outside people are just starting to go out. I mean, it's a Thursday night. It's nine o'clock, you know. The pubs will be closing soon. The clubs will be opening. And yeah, the night is young. And so tomorrow morning, when they have to go to work for Friday and the alarm clock goes off, if they've even gone to sleep, <laughs> then they'll hit that alarm clock. Uh, uh. And so all of that passion, yeah, in the morning, it manifests as ignorance so this we have to see how this is working but for many of us if you if you go to bed early <laughs> then getting up early is an easier activity and but who cares about getting up early anyway well most people don't most people this is how they start their day right so they get out of they crawl out of bed after hitting the alarm clock four times minimum and then they inject passion. Let me have a cup of coffee. Yeah, wow, I'm awake now. <laughs> it's like how to kickstart your heart, you know, how to kickstart your life just by pouring caffeine into your system. Of course, other people do other things in the morning to get themselves going, which may be more in the mode of ignorance. But this is, this is kind of the way that people are, because people are already managing the modes. If you can see that, people already know, oh, I don't want to get up, I don't want to do I don't want to, uh, so let me manage the fact that I'm completely delusional and completely like, you know, lethargic and completely absorbed and uh, let me, let me try to fix that so that I can come to a different state of consciousness where at least I'm now awake and somewhat motivated, but how? by taking some drug basically because caffeine is a drug so then you you inject this into your system so that all of a sudden you're like you know feeling enlivened so people are already managing the modes they're already managing the gunas but they're they're doing it not really in the correct way and long term it won't have the result because what happens this is what happens. This is the Rajas Thomas cycle. <laughs> you you get up in the morning feeling like, eh, then you fill yourself full of stuff and go, ah, and then <laughs> by like three or four or five in the afternoon, you're like, eh, you know, and you just crash again because you completely bypass any goodness. And goodness is the secret to maintenance. There's a nice verse from the Brahma Samhita which, in which um, Lord Brahma describes that we should take things in slow degrees. Just slow and steady wins the race. But no, Raja says, let's do it fast. Let's do it now. Let's do it, you know, like that. You know, and ignorance is like, let's not do it at all, man. <laughs> Don't worry about it. You know? So... Where is the consciousness? Goodness is yes, no problem. Let's do it. Let's do it the correct way. And let's take our time doing it. Let's make sure that we do it. No, 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 we got to, you know, and see, you feel that pull of passion. Oh, we feel the pull of ignorance. Oh God, I'm so tired of doing this. So we, we have to find this space where we can maintain a consistent and steady positive consciousness so that we actually feel peaceful and happy because that's what will come when we introduce sattva into our life we take rest early and we get up early 
because the early hours of the morning are the most conducive times for spiritual development. Now, we're discussing the modes here. We haven't even gotten to being transcendental to the modes, but it's described that we first have to come to the platform of the mode of goodness. Then when we come to the platform of the mode of goodness, then that becomes a springboard to transcendence. So we can't be a victim. We have to take responsibility and ownership to manage our modes to manage our consciousness and the way that we allow the material energy to affect us, we have to take responsibility for managing this. So if we take responsibility of how we're living our lives, then we can basically shape our minds, shape our bodies by the things that we do. So a rajastic lifestyle or diet and environment will condition our minds to be restless, will be agitated, will be anxious. Similarly, if you have a tamasic lifestyle, then you're going to become lethargic, depressed, dull, bored. Uh, so let's become conscious and take responsibility and think before we act. Then we can experience the fourth mode then we can come to the platform of transcendence. So ignorance, passion, goodness, and then ultimately we can transcend by coming to the mode of goodness and it becomes a springboard by which it's very natural for us to easily take to sadhana, a, a daily practice, a regular practice of introducing Krishna and spiritual activity into our lives so that we do it daily, steadily. Not like, I had a good weekend, yeah, I got really fired up, I went to the temple, I did a few things, and then Monday I'm back to all nonsense. No, let's be steady. <laughs> let's, let's slowly introduce some activities that will help me to become elevated in my Krishna consciousness so that I can transcend these modes. So that's the end of uh, the show, Hare Krishna. So I was seven minutes over, please forgive me. Uh, I don't know if there's any more questions. Okay. Rajifu, I'm here as your servant. Please instruct me. Shishashte ham sarimam tvam prapanam. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Janus Abra. That was really amazing. and. I really, really enjoyed that. And I wanted to, um, I actually wanted to keep hearing it actually because it was so good and uh, definitely want to apply it to my life about changing in the modes. So we can always um, fall into the mode of sleeping late and that um, mode of passion creeps in. So it's very important that we uh, learn how to manage the modes. And I, and I think you've uh, really inspirationally uh, said that. So if everybody liked uh, what Jane and Tai Prabhu had, had taught us today. Can you just maybe show some appreciation on the chat? Did everyone had uh, uh, have a good session? Um, it'd be really nice if you all uh, uh, wrote something on the chat. And um, yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Um, so one thing I wanted to share as well is, um, and, I, and I'm not taking your permission to share this, Jane and Tai Prabhu, but I hope you don't mind. Um, Jane is happy was, huh? I don't know what you're going to share, so it's hard <laughs> for me to say if I mind or not. <laughs> uh, I hope you don't. Uh, so he's recently launched a bhakti portal, um, which is a fantastic <laughs> avenue for learning. Uh, so there's teachings on learning Gita, instruments, spiritual leadership. So um, if it's okay, I'm going to put the link on our WhatsApp group and. Um, so yeah, it's a really amazing uh, portal that you know you can access or you can share with your friends. And I think there's uh, a fifty percent discount code as well, so I, I'll share that as well. So yeah, um, please log on to that because I, 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 it looks pretty amazing. Here we go. <laughs> uh, here's one I prepared earlier. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm. I just uh, I want to share what I've learned over many years with as many people as possible. So we've created a, a portal where there are online courses. There are more coming, but we've started somewhere. 
We also have different activities that are happening on Facebook and Instagram. Um, uh, and uh, I always forget, what is this called? LinkedIn. LinkedIn, yeah, thank you. Uh, LinkedIn. Uh, I'm not very not very good with all these things, but some people are trying to help me. <laughs> but so, uh, but you can join in all these different places, and uh, just get involved. I'm working also very closely with um, a very good friend of mine, Radhalanda Nishwar Prabhu, who is a wonderful musician, Kirtanir. So there are some courses on the Bhakti portal for learning Murdanga, learning harmonium. Uh, we're working on a course for cartels and more courses on harmonium and stuff like that. And so there'll be lots of things coming. It's just the early days and beginning. So I appreciate Rajiv for you, you um, promoting that. Sorry, I just self-promoted myself, but I'm not really so into that, but I'm being encouraged to do it these days. <laughs> so thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much for sharing with us, Jenny Zaipalu. And uh, yeah, thank you all for joining. I think Dennis Hapa has been so kind to deliver us, uh, I think, three sessions now. If, yeah, three sessions. So yeah, please, please show your gratitude to him. And uh, we're very fortunate to have such a personality sharing such wisdom with us. And hopefully we see you all next week. It's um, Ravnami, Ramnami on Sunday. So there'll be a celebration at the Soho Temple from, uh, I think it's 12, uh, it's all day, but I think the, the celebrations is, is, is all day. The food is at two, the feast, so just, so you know, <laughs> the, the main information, and there's a drama and there's a, a class as well in the evening. So yeah, please do come along and uh, yeah, please show your gratitude by saying loud hurry balls to Jen Taku. Hari bol, 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 Hari Mm -hmm. Come again, please. <laughs> Come again. <laughs> Prabhu, Prabhu, can yeah. I just say something to share? I We always think Krishna is in the house and it's our duty to keep the house clean, the kitchen, the fridge, but I forgot the floor. We did sweep every day, but in the evening after my son come back, there are sometimes, you know, leaves coming in from outside because of the strong wind. And we just bypass until tomorrow. So uh, you remind me that 24 hour Krishna house have to be clean. <laughs> 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 Thank you so Thank much, you. Prabhu. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Well, Hare Krishna. Well. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Just a matter you, do you have your hand up for something? Or? Yes, I do, Prabhuji. Um, you mentioned earlier at the beginning that you do management course or group of, of three modes of uh, gunas. Mm -hmm. Did I miss here? What, what, what is that? What was what group's that? And, and how do you get about it? Did you, did you mention something like you that you were in a group of some sort of? Well, I, I speak to many different groups. <laughs> ah. but, um, um, <clears throat> so, but I think what I said was... Um, that that guna management is from a, what, the course one of the courses it's on the bhakti portal i also explain it uh more in depth there 